I'm Old Big One. This is the Inside Edge video blog. Okay, it's that time of year again. It's tax season again. It seems like just yesterday uh, I had to restock my bar for tax season, and here we are again. It comes around quicker than, it, than you ever expect. So I'm in the process of finishing filing all my taxes. So wanted to do. I always do a few of these blogs every year on taxes. The, the topic sucks. I hate talking about taxes. It just gets my blood pressure up most of the time. Uh, and uh, but we've taxes. There's only two things in life, as they say that are uh, certain that's death and taxes. So I want to talk a, a couple of bunch of topics here, rapid fire. There's a whole bunch of tax topics in the news in Canada and in the United States that I want to run through and make people aware of. Uh, so I'm going to rattle them off here. First thing, a couple of weeks ago, the uh, U.S. government, Joe Biden, announced that he's planning on increasing capital gains tax uh, for Americans. Uh, he's going to bump it up to uh, 50%. It'll actually be over 50% in a couple of states like California and New York City. So, you know, we're already at 50% here. I mean, we used to be uh, at 75, uh, and then the Harper government, the Conservatives, I believe, reduced it down to 50. That's where we sit now. Don't be surprised if that gets bumped up uh, in the coming years. We're running some pretty big deficits here. I'll talk about that in a minute. Now, you know, this wasn't a real, I mean, it hasn't been passed yet, but a lot of people were caught off guard by it, surprised. The stock market took a dip for a couple of days on the news, which was strange, recovered pretty quick. You know, I talked to my friends on Wall Street about this. We knew this was coming for a long time. Joe Biden ran on this last year as part of his campaign promise. You know, it's not a big deal uh, for, for most of my friends down in the States because they're investors. They're not speculators or traders. You know, we already pay a 50% capital gains tax. And if we were to raise that up here to back up to 75%, you know, it would be disappointing. I'd sure like to keep it at 50%, but it wouldn't have a big impact on me at all. For the simple reason that, as you guys know, I'm a buy and hold investor. I buy companies and I also buy real estate and then hold it for decades. I don't like to incur the friction costs. The friction costs meaning the taxes going in, the commissions, uh, uh, and of course the capital gains tax when you sell. You know, you can do that tax free in an RRSP or TFSA, but when you get a big enough portfolio, and if you're doing it right, you know, the vast majority of your stock holdings are going to be in cash accounts, non-registered accounts, because they don't really let us shelter very much money here in Canada. So in those accounts, when you sell a stock and you've got a profit on it, you'll pay a capital gain, 50%. But I tend to let my stocks ride, as do most investors down in the States. Just keep the, that growth compounding, keep it uh, growing month over month, year after year. You don't incur any capital gain until you sell. Down the road, sure, you can sell. But I've talked about it in my book. You know, My goal is never have to sell assets. There's a lot of companies that I will never sell. I will just comfortably live off the dividends. Maybe, hey, when I get into my 60s and I want to take a trip around the world for a month or something, hey, maybe then I'll sell 20 or $30,000 worth of shares, pay the capital gains and, and take the money and, and buy some air, uh, air, airline tickets with it. But for the most part, I just like to let my capital gains keep compounding and growing, snowballing as Warren Buffett calls it. So it's not a huge deal. A couple other things here. So of course, there's also talk about cooling the red hot real estate market. I saw an article by a, a BMO economist. Uh, he came up, they're already talking about, you know, raising capital gains tax because we already have a speculation tax in Canada, as I said many times before. We've got a number of them, capital gains tax and the property transfer tax. Uh, those are the two biggest uh, speculation taxes going or what we call the friction costs, which are extremely expensive with real estate. But they're also, you know, tabling ideas about possibly, and I think this is a sacred cow right now, about tweaking the principal residence exemption, either removing it altogether, or as this BMO economist came out with a solution, he had probably the best one I've seen so far. Keep the principal resident exemption, but it works on a five-year sliding scale. So if you sell the property within a year, you pay full capital gains. If you, uh, after two years, it reduces down to 80% after three years down to 60, after five years of holding a property, you would retain the full principal residence exemption. And if you sold the home, all the uh, um, capital gain would go to you tax-free. I would be fine with something like this. Again, it would have no impact on me whatsoever and it would have virtually no impact on any of my clients. 
because as you guys know, I always educate my clients going in about the friction cost with real estate and how expensive it is to get in and out of real estate. PTT on the way in, biggest tax grab there is. You might have GST of 5%. When it comes time to sell it, you're gonna have real estate commissions, which are expensive. I don't come cheap. And you're gonna have capital gains tax on it. Or if it's a principal residence right now, that would be tax free. But for me, my buyers, whether it's an investment unit or a principal residence buy it, we're gonna buy this and hopefully hold it for decades. Or if we, something came up and we had to move to another province and the market was down, keep it, rent it, wait for the market to recover and then sell it. So all my clients are holding properties well in excess of five years. We're talking 10, 15, 20 is what I'd like to see for my clients. So this would retain the full principal resident exemption. I'm fine with that. As a matter of fact, I think if you instigated something like this, don't be surprised if prices don't go up more with something like this, because again, it would further restrict people from selling. And here I am a realtor and I'm telling you, hang on to your properties for the most part. There's lots of good reasons to sell though. As I've said many times, you know, want to move up, upsize, downsize, move to another city, retire. You know, in my business, I see, you know, financial situations, divorce that are forcing people to sell. There's lots of reasons why you need to sell, but speculating, you know, shouldn't be one of them. So having a five-year rule here where you have to hold the house for five years and then get the full principal residence, that's fine. And I think it would probably, you would see that probably be a boon for long-term price appreciation because it would just further restrict supply. It would, it would limit the churn and the number of homes that come up for sale. I think you'll also see, as I read an article in the Wall Street Journal talking about the capital gains tax increase, same thing. Jim Cramer on Mad Money was talking about this too. If you're an investor and you're a buy and hold investor buying quality companies like the Apples and the Visas and the Johnson and Johnsons and, and the Costco's and McDonald's and Pepsi's, Amazon's and, and uh, everything else, hey, this will force people to hang on to stocks longer, which in my opinion is a good thing. When you hold on to stocks longer, remember there's not an infinite supply of shares available. Sure, some companies will issue more shares, but the, for the most part, for a lot of these big blue chip companies like a Johnson & Johnson or a Pepsi or a Coke, the shares are set. As a matter of fact, with a lot of these companies, the share count is shrinking. Apple just announced they're buying back another $90 billion of shares. So you've got a, a shrinking share count plus a capital gains tax that encourages people to hold on to stocks longer. That shrinks the available amount of stocks available to purchase, which will juice the prices, stock price up. Think about it. A few other things here that I wanted to talk about here. Um, you know, I continue to, to tell people, you know, and I've talked about this before, the city of Vancouver, they're up to their old tricks again, as are the NDP. So an article, and it was also in the news here last uh, month, on the, uh, on the BC Speculation and Vacancy Tax, the SVT. And this is an, an absolute insidious tax that the NDP are charging uh, property owners, commercial property owners. So there's a story of the guy that owns the Las Margaritas Mexican restaurant on West 4th. And they have been getting hit with massive, massive uh, tax increases. And this speculation vacancy tax as well, where they actually tax vacant lots. But in this particular case on West 4th, you know, they don't tax a property to what its current use is. They tax it, uh, the property, based on its best and highest use. So for instance, on this property on West 4th, even though it's a single story restaurant, they tax it like it's a six story condo building. Can you imagine, I mean, only in Vancouver in BC do we get this kind of taxes. It doesn't make any sense at all. So this guy has been hit with these massive tax increases because you have to understand in commercial uh, leases, they are what we call triple net. They're very different than a, than a residential uh, tenancy. Triple net leases is where the, the tenant pays all the costs, pays for the taxes, uh, uh, pays the insurance, the upkeep of the, of the building, everything else. And in residential, it's the other way around. The owner pays for that. They're also very long-term leases, 10, 15, 20 year leases, because the owners build out 
the storefronts, whether that's a store or a restaurant, they can invest hundreds of thousands of dollars building those stores and restaurants. <clears throat> so of course they want a long-term commitment there from the landlord. So they're stuck in these long-term leases and getting these massive property tax increases because they're based on their best use as opposed to the current use. And in this particular situation, it's based on a, something like a five or six story condo tower. But here's where it gets even more ridiculous. They act, they, well, they, they talk about this, it's meant to encourage owners to build and develop properties. But you can't in Vancouver though. They act like this owner of this property can turn around and build a five or six story condo. And it's not gonna happen. First off, they're locked into long-term leases, triple net. And then can you imagine, they act like you can just go down to City Hall and say, I wanna build a hundred unit condo tower on this lot. It's not gonna happen. It's gonna take you a decade to get the permits and everything else and run it through the gauntlet known as City Hall. <coughs> and not to mention getting it through the NIMBYs and everything else. So they're taxing you at best use maximum use, which is five or six story condo, even though it's only a single story restaurant, but you can't do it anyways. It's crazy. You know, I feel for these store owners along areas like West 4th and Robson Street and Howe Street downtown. You know, the city of Vancouver here, as I often said, they speak with forked tongue, as does the NDP. They talk one side, they talk out one side of their mouth saying that they want to do something about housing affordability, condo prices, detached home prices. We, everybody in BC should be able to afford a home. They talk a big talk. And then on the other side, they tax everything to death. They never met a tax that they didn't like. Empty homes and vacancy tax, this SVT tax, speculation and vacancy tax, Vancouver empty homes tax, property transfer tax, GST. I would love to tell you guys some stories here about th through developers that I know, smaller developers working the Vancouver East side, about doing townhouse complexes, 20, 30, 40, 50 unit wood frames in Grandview, Renfrew, Hastings Sunrise area. But I can't, I can't share this stuff on my blog, unfortunately, but here's what I will tell you. Vancouver City Hall has, as I think most people realize, has their hands out at every step of the way. To build a typical one bedroom condo right now in Vancouver, it's something like 160, 170,000 is going to Vancouver City Hall in permits, zoning, in uh, neighborhood improvements that they have to do, infrastructure improvements that they have to give Vancouver City Hall. It's well over 200,000 per two bedroom unit. But you never hear the city talk about this stuff. They're the biggest money earner for every piece of real estate you see being built. It's not the developer. Listen, developers make a very good living. Don't get me wrong. But I don't think, I think people don't realize how tight the margins are with most Vancouver based developers. Sure, they make money, but it's probably running somewhere between 15 and 18% are the margins that I see. And we're talking that takes four, five, six years from start to finish before they're taking, taking over the keys. Plus the unbelievable amount of risk and uncertainty that these developers take on to build a 10 or 15 story mid-rise condo or even a four story or five story wood frame in East Vancouver. The real winners here are Vancouver City Hall and, and to some extent the provincial government in the form of taxes. They take on no risk whatsoever and they've got their hands out at every corner. Some of the dirty things they do here, I'm not gonna get into specifics, but they will get a developer into this. They'll do all, go through all the work, years and years of planning, getting it through, hand out at every corner, and then at the last minute they'll throw in some added expense, some upgrade they need to the infrastructure, to the sewer, the water storm system, whatever. And oh, that's gonna be another $700,000 we're gonna need for you to do that. This is how, it, how it's working. They'll tell you on the one hand they wanna do something about affordability and for housing, and on the other hand, they've got their hand out at every, every step of the way. The developers are taking all the risk and making a reasonable profit. The city of Vancouver makes out like a bandit. Not only do they collect all this tax revenue, and we're talking tens of millions of dollars in a typical 40 or 50 unit building, 
plus all the infrastructure upgrades and everything else. But then they build a 50 unit condo comp, uh, building. There's another 50 new tax roll entries paying the annual property tax every year. So they're, they're a wash in cash. Now, where does this cash go? We need to be doing an audit on Vancouver City Hall. You know, people should be up in arms about this stuff of where all this money is going. Where is it going? Well, I, I, from what I hear, I have first heard that it's about a million dollars a day into that black hole known as downtown east side. I hear it's more like two million every single day, close to a billion dollars. I, I know we're, they're buying up hotels left and right. They're the biggest property purchaser in the province. They've been buying up these old dilapidated uh, SROs, paying 50, 60, 70 million dollars a pop for them. They don't do any negotiating. You want 70 million for your hotel? No problem. They just pay market rate. You know, people should really be questioning Vancouver City Hall and the NDP for a lot of this stuff. They speak with sport fork tongue. You know, instead they throw the boogeyman out there as the realtors, the foreign buyers, the speculators, the empty homes, the money launderers, all this other stuff. But yet the, the big money is going to Vancouver City Hall in the province in the form of taxes and permits and zoning and community upgrades and everything else. A lot of people would say, hey, well, that's great. We want the developer to, you know, have to have to put in a 200 or 250,000 to improve a park or the sidewalks or the infrastructure. Well, that's fine. They will. But guess what? That money is going to come out of your pocket in the purchase price of that home. That's how this works. They just pass it on to the consumer. Somebody needs to teach the city of Vancouver and the NDP about how taxes work and the elasticity of how taxes work. They seem to think that you can just keep taxing, 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 and taxing, and there's no end to it. And we'll spend it all on the other end, no problem. We'll just keep raising taxes, putting in more restrictions. But that's not how it works. These increased bureaucracy, we'll call it, that the city charges these developers just gets passed on in the final price per square foot of the home. Just like I've talked about it many times for me as a landlord. You know, when my insurance costs go up, when my strata fees go up, when my property taxes go up, and all the bureaucracy I've got to go through if I need to do renos or anything else, eventually, not in lockstep, I pass that on to my tenants. I raise the rent. That's how it works. Maybe not right away, but when the tenant gives me notice and moves out and I put another tenant in, I raise the rent 200 or 250 a month to cover all those expenses. That's, that's how taxes work here. But the city of Vancouver, I think people really should be paying attention to them. They're the culprit here. They're adding the big cost to housing here in the form of all these restrictions and taxes, which are going to get passed on to you either as a tenant or as a uh, as the end uh, purchaser of a brand new condo it just gets passed on to you we should be doing an audit of city hall people should be up in arms about where is all this money going they are just a wash in cash here and ask yourself this the city of vancouver keeps throwing out all these restrictions more taxes empty homes everything has it done anything for housing prices costs it hasn't. It's done exactly what I've been saying it was going to do for the last seven or eight years. It was going to add a cost to housing, make it more expensive to buy and make it more expensive to rent. What's the common denominator here? It's the city of Vancouver. These taxes aren't, going to, aren't working. They're the biggest culprit. Again, they take on no risk and collect all the money, but they never talk about that. Do you ever hear them talking about the money that they charge these developers per unit? You don't because they don't want you to find that out. You know, just on a final note here, again, I think we should be, you know, they, they, they talk as well just too about, you know, BC speculation tax and the Vancouver empty homes tax and all this other stuff to curb speculation. I don't see, and I haven't seen for a long time, very much speculation in this market in Vancouver. I mean, do you have uh, renovators buying older dilapidated units, fixing them up and then putting them back on the market. You've got a bit of that, absolutely. But these are pros. I've done many blogs on this. These are professional renovators. They do all the labor themselves. They have their own trades. They're just paying for the materials. 
even there too, the, 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 the profit margins they're making are slim. They are. And I would advise you don't do it on your own unless you can do all the labor and you know what you're doing with this. Outside of that, there is very little to no speculation going on in this market. The reason there isn't is because we've got cra these crazy high tax friction costs and taxes. You've got 2% PTT going in. You might have GST if it's, a, if it's a new condo. You've got commissions to sell. You've got two sets of conveyancing fees and you've got capital gains tax. Once you take all those things out, you buy a condo and you're able to sell it for 50K more in a year from now. After you take those costs off, you're, you actually lost money. So there's very little speculation out there. But we should be doing something, you know, about where our taxes are going. I don't think people realize how much City Hall is adding to the cost of new construction. It's outrageous. Just on the last topic here, you know, I feel for a lot of these business owners and I think We've got to, I try and support small business as much as I can in Vancouver because they have really got, got things going against them here. You know, we've got a crazy tax system here and these triple net leases where the city's charging them these outrageous ta property taxes for best use that you couldn't build best use even if you wanted to. And these guys are in long-term leases. They can't get out of them anyways. Just last topic here, you know, they're just squeezing Vancouverites endlessly here. Off topic here, but just look at, I'm fortunate enough, I live downtown and for my downtown listings, I walk to most of them. That's the nice thing about me living downtown and selling condos in the West End and Coal Harbor and, and uh, Yale Town. I can walk to a lot of my appointments and showings, but I do get in my car from time to time and I've got stuff in Mount Pleasant and Olympic Village and Kitts and Richmond. So I drive a lot too, but I walk a lot. But downtown, I tell you, the parking is getting, as people know, is getting slowly removed. The city of Vancouver doesn't want your car in the city. I'm lucky I can walk to most stuff anyways, but I feel for people that have to drive and I feel for shop owners and things that rely on people coming in from outside the downtown because you can't park. And then when you do find a parking spot, you know, the parking rates have gone up, what, three, four hundred percent here, I bet, in the last five years, maybe more. Somebody can tell me. All I know is I went to go get a burrito bowl over at Chipotle over here on Howe Street. I haven't parked there for a while. I mean, I think it used to be about 50 cents for 15 minutes. 50 cents for 15 minutes. That's what it used to be. I parked there the other day. It's $1.75 for 15 minutes. And if, God forbid, if there's a lineup out the door at Chipotle, you're going to have to put in 25 or 30 minutes on there. It's, you know, the way we're going, it's going to cost you more to park than it is to get a burrito. Businesses cannot sustain that type of taxes because that, all that is is just a tax grab. So we need to have some accountability here. I mean, we need to start questioning where our money is going here in the city of Vancouver. Enough is enough. City of Vancouver has to realize that. Eventually, people will just give up on it. Eventually, business owners will say, you know what? I'm not going to hire those two extra employees. I'm not going to open that second outlet. I'm not going to expand because you're just killing me on the taxes. The margins just aren't there for me to take on that kind of risk. And of course, there doesn't seem to be any end to it. They don't understand how the elasticity of taxes work. Eventually, it stretches too far and it breaks. And we're probably getting pretty close to that. But we should be questioning this stuff. This is what people should be protesting. You should be protesting where your tax money is going. We should have an audit of where all our money is going, the billions that we're pumping into this city. And you'd be surprised, I think a lot of people don't realize the biggest profiteer in all the new construction being built, the easy money is with the city of Vancouver. And they keep raising it and raising it even more with these developers. I'm Owen Bigline, as always, thanks for watching. I'll see you next week.